Okay, so look, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those that don't know me, um, I'm Lachlan Kalish from the Division of Learning and Teaching. Um, my title today is Digital Innovation Lead, uh, generally involved with learning technologies, training, PD, et cetera, and working with uh, the faculties and schools, very much a um, teacher teaching facing role. Today's session, uh, which is the start of the, the 2023-30 PD series, is uh, looking at the Turnitin uh, Feedback Studio that, that we have an integration for within Blackboard that we've had a very large uptake of over the past six months. And this session, particularly, it's, those numbers have kind of gone through the roof with people getting on board with that. And what we're going to be looking at today uh, specifically really is grading within the Feedback Studio, how that process works, and really the a focus area which has just kind of leapt out uh, at us is uh, on the difference between using qualitative and quantitative rubrics for the marking process because uh, there has been a, a, a mass uh, sort of uh, interest over the past fortnight particularly with people wanting to see whether or not quantitative rubric marking is going to suit them and how we can make that work for them so i thought we might as well make that the first session because the interest is there and people are setting up assignments and things at the moment. So for um, with today's session, look, in terms of formality, et cetera, if you've got questions and things, please put them in the post as we go or comments to each other. Um, I'm not precious about any of that at all. Um, I'll try and stop periodically to, to get your uh, comments and questions as we can um, with the caveat in there that there's a, a lot to go through. It is being recorded. If you do have other questions that I'm not getting to, then by all means, um, still leave them in the chat or email me directly and I'll get back to you as well after that. Uh, and I'll keep admitting people as I see them crop up. All right, so look, I am referring periodically to the Turnitin Quick Guide, um, which we update, seem to update kind of on a weekly basis at the moment, but uh, that document, um, is available in DOMS and certainly the links to the rubrics that we're talking about um, is also in this document. So I'll drop that into the chat in a second, but specifically on page five, um, there is a link there to that talks about the, the rubric template. It opens up a page in DOMS and um, that page, once it opens, assuming it's gonna work for me, DOMS is always a little bit temperamental, um, will allow you to download one of two rubrics. And we'll look at those today. One is a qualitative rubric, which is a basic template with five columns, high distinction, distinction, credit, etc. And the other one um, is a new one that I've added in for people wanting to create uh, quantitative rubrics. And I will be showing you that um, shortly. For the purpose of today's demonstration, I'm taking some liberties with uh, one of Kim Bailey's subjects, as I tend to do. Um, and basically, she has an assignment in here, uh, which is pretty standard uh, text, traditional text format, um, particularly for law students. It's a legal memo. I've got the details here from the subject outline, and I'm going to create that portal very quickly. And then we're going to look at the marking aspect to go alongside that. So I've got the details that I need to create the portal here. Um, I am now going to go into the folder for assignment two, which currently has no Turnitin portal, and I'm going to make one very quickly. I am sharing my screen. Can I confirm you can all see my screen? Fantastic. Right, so build content, turn it in. I'm going to drop in the details for that task as I just got them. So this was assessment two, which was a legal memo. And this is a Turnitin submission portal. So I won't have any students coming to me saying, what is the Turnitin submission portal? Where is the Turnitin sub submission portal? We always label things very, very uh, um, directly or uh, clearly here. 35% for the task. I got that from... The outline, what else did we get there? We had a due date of the 1st of May. One minute to midnight. And a return date, which Turnitin calls a feedback release date of 22nd of May. 22nd of May. 
again, one minute to midnight. Having a look at my optional settings. Uh, file submissions allow students to submit late. Make sure that's ticked. If it's not, otherwise the students won't be able to submit if they've got extensions. There's a spelling and grammar checker on. Students submit to standard repository. They get the report straight away. They can keep resubmitting until the due date. We want the students to be able to see the reports. If you've been using the Turnitin portals at all, this should all be pretty familiar to you, but these are the settings that we check. Oh, good morning, Kim Bailey. Uh, I promise I won't break your subject site. Um, okay, so what we've done here in creating or recreating this task, submitting it, that assignment portal is now in place for this subject. And we do not have a rubric attached for it. Right at the moment with I2 items, it's right down the bottom. Let's bring it back up to the top. We'll use the reorder tool. And there is our portal. Now, by default, there's no description in there. We need to add a description in. So I'm going to go in and edit the item description. Probably one of the most overlooked things, the visibility of the Turnitin portal, which comes up here. It's not talking about whether or not students can see the portal. It's talking about the Grade Center column. Now, if the Grade Center column is visible to students, which it is by default, as soon as you start marking, they're going to see it. And you probably don't want them to see it until you're ready for that to happen. So we always need to make sure we come in here and switch that across to no. The mark's correct. The, the due date is correct. We have no description currently. Now, one thing you may have noticed is that Blackboard has changed your ability to copy and paste text and keep formatting into its descriptions. So if you've been copying uh, the text that we have for our assignments, which is something like this, into the text, it won't keep the formatting anymore, which is hugely annoying. All you get is a big a dump of text. But what I did find is that if you happen to have the code that sits behind that, we can change to our code view, paste the code, and then it keeps all of our formatting for us. So a slight workaround, but it's only because Blackboard removed our ability to copy and paste content and keep formatting bullet points, bold font, little things, but yeah, um, it's, it is a way to do that quickly. All right, so we've got our description, we've got our task. So let's get back to looking at our rubrics. Normally what we would be doing at this point, going into the Turnitin portal, it's going to load our dashboard with our full list from the subject side. It pulls that student list from our grade center. There it is. And we would go to the settings for this task, which we were looking at a minute ago. Under optional settings, we go down to attach a rubric. And then we start playing around in the Turnitin Feedback Studios rubric manager. Now, what we want to have in place before we get to this point is that we have populated the Excel template with the rubric for this task, which I may have done in advance. For this particular task, same as in the subject outline, we have four criterion. We've got our columns, we've got our descriptors inside each of the criterion. So that's ready to go. I've labeled it pretty clearly. Try and keep your file names nice and short. Otherwise, Turnitin might turn around and reject them. It likes short, concise file names. Don't use underscores. Don't use special characters. Keep it nice and succinct. Again, that's mentioned in the quick guide. So that's ready for us to bring into the feedback studio. We've populated it in advance. So I'm going to launch the rubric manager, which is a fiddly little thing. Uh, but basically, we want to go up to the export import button, top right corner, import. We're going to drag in our file that we've got ready, our Excel template, which was law, 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 legal memo. That looks pretty good. Let's try that one. We get our tick. Now we have to go back into the rubric manager. It's just got this generic one sitting there. So we have to actually now load the one that we've imported, which we do by hitting the menu, top left-hand corner. 
You'll find it in the list alphabetized. You probably won't see as many of these as I have to. Law, 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 law. Three. Legal memo. Right, that looks pretty good. I hope that's the one. Okay, so here's our, our rubric in here, ready to play with. What we're looking at, let me make this full screen, is we've got our four criterion, but down the bottom here, our rubric area is the, probably the most important part. By default, a qualitative rubric is selected. And what that means is that if we start using this, this will be a visual indication only for your marking for the students, telling them that where their attempt has fallen. Um, but there's no correlation between that necessarily and the grade that gets calculated. You've got complete sort of discretion in and around that um, to basically say that, yes, I've selected dis uh, distinction here, but, you know, you could be an 84, you could be a 75, you could be anywhere in between potentially for uh, those particular options. We will choose qualitative for this particular one, but it still won't let me save. The save and cancel buttons are down here, down the bottom, and I can't select them until I make one change, any change at all to one of these cells, even if I put in a space. Click outside, and now the save button down here is visible. So I can click save. Don't ask me why, it's just fiddly. So it's now saved. We can close the rubric manager. It's still not selected for this task. I have to hit the drop down, and the most recent file you've been working on will be at the very bottom of the list. There it is, legal memo. So this is now attached to the task. I can submit. I get the green setting. This doesn't disappear. I have to actually close it or get out of it, but it has saved and attached the rubric. At this point in time, how do we know that there's a rubric here? I get lots of academics saying to me, well, I loaded it, but I can't see it. How do I see it? Best way really for you to do this is to do a faux submission, which we can do by clicking on grade for any of the students. Do we really want to grade without a submission? We absolutely do. It will create a thing called a grading template, which is just a blank document effectively. We can grade that paper. I get another warning, which is saying it's a draft because we're before the due date. That's why it's got that word draft submission. Yep, I still want to go ahead with it. So I have my blank document and I've got my marking tools over here on the right hand side. There is no turn it in submission red icons for us to choose from because there's no text. That's why the red bit's not there. All right, so let's open up our grading tools and have a look. I'll make this a bit bigger for us three areas to look at. We've got our quick marks, our summative feedback at the end, and our rubric tool. So I'm skimming over this and I'll stop for questions and comments in a minute, but we're just looking at the tool set, the basic tool set that's available for you to mark with. The quick marks involve you dragging and dropping text boxes that have been pre-created into the actual document wherever you like. There are a number of pre-made menus that are in there. They're not amazing but um, they are there by default. And most people using this will want to have created their own quick mark set. This is a pretty common practice. What it's going to involve is going into this cog for the quick marks tool and you deciding through the menus up the top to create your own set. Quick new set up the top. We'll call it Lachlan's Amazing Set. At that point, we hit submit. It's down here in the list. At the moment, it has zero quick marks for me to use, so I can start adding those. But at this point, once it's selected, you add them in the middle section. So let's say, for example, I wanted a comment in here for, I don't know, whatever you want it to be. Amazing. Then it has a description, which are students, when they click on the speech bubble, it says amazing. They'll see the text for it. More info goes in here. You can hyperlink in there. It has some basic formatting options. You can use up to 100 words inside your description if you want to. And then we hit submit. It adds it to my set. I can then add it to other sets if I want to. 
So if you're using, if you've created a number of uh, uh, particular quick marks and you want to add them into different sets, you can certainly do that over here. But what we have down the bottom, uh, down the bottom here, looking at my set, is that there is one uh, uh, quick mark available. So do we get the idea at that point? You keep adding as many quick marks as you like, and then you um, can start using them as long as you choose your set from the list. So, sorry, Lachlan, um, if I wanted to share that with other markers. Great question. The way that this works, if you want to share it with other markers, is you have to export your quick mark set, which we do through the menu up the top here, export set. It's going to give you a file from this process, uh, which is uh, called a QMF file, quick marks file. It can only be used in Turnitin. And I was hoping really that I would get some kind of confirmation that it was doing that for me, but hey, we don't get everything we want. Let's do it again. Maybe it's doing it and I just can't see it. Anyhow, I won't get hung up on that, but basically that's what you're doing. You go into your set, you hit export set, and it's going to give you a QMF file that you send to your other markers. They will then import that set and they will have access to it as well. Is that Does that go to downloads or where does that go? Yeah, it depends on your browser settings. Most oh, people, it'll okay. go to downloads. Okay. Maybe if you've um, fiddled around with it, that you might see that it uh, has, has gone to your desktop or something, but only if you've changed that. Usually goes to downloads. All right. So I'm going to close this. If I wanted to use the quick mark set that I would I had created, I will need to now find it from the list, from the drop down list. It was called LK's Amazing Set. There it is. And at this point, there's my one that I made, and I can then start dragging it in. That's how our quick marks work. You can make them as complex or as simple as you like. But uh, as you've already picked up, the power in these is when you get to share them with a marking team, for example, and you're all using the same quick marks, the same, um, uh, you know, um, types of feedback, et cetera. Kim, did you want to um, comment on, on the quick marks process? Has that been effective for you with your marking teams? Yeah, I really recommend it. Um, we work with a unique referencing system in law, which is incredibly complicated. And um, it has um, dozens and dozens of rules. And so we pre-populate quick, mark, quick marks with all of those specific rules. So that if we see a particular error, we're just dragging over rather than writing out, you know, rule seven, please note your citation, et cetera. And we share that amongst the markers, which is also great. It means we get consistency in terminology and expression and rules as well. So, um, and sometimes if you've got markers who might be marking a little harshly and you want to sort of educate them in positive comments to students and feedback, it can be a good way of gently prompting them to do that too. It's a really good point. Very, very um, simple way to at least establish a consistent benchmark for feedback within uh, within the document. Um, Pop Go ahead, another Chris. one in. Is it better to have uh, comments that can be used more than once, um, so that they're not so personalised that they're, you know, yeah. If you get my point, so is it better to have comments that can be reused when making comments and papers than to have idiosyncratic ones all the time? I don't think they need to be mutually exclusive, I guess, is my my, yeah, my take okay. on that. I think having um, markups like this, annotations within the text that are, are consistent, as long as the detail is is there, so it's mm. meaningful. Um, I have seen quite a lot of use of, of quick marks where it is kind of one word takes like this, where it's people kind of cutting corners because it's quicker to kind of do that and drag it in. I like there to be some substance behind those comments. Yeah. So that means there's going to be something in the description or at least there's meaning there rather than yeah. maybe yeah. just positive reinforcement. I'm not saying there's no place for it. It's just that I, I, I like there to be a bit of substance with the feedback. But having said that, once you shift across into the summative feedback, the second common area where we get up to a thousand words um, for the feedback, then uh, I think you can have both. Um the fact that you can left click inside the document anywhere and choose between three types of feedback, whether it's from the quick marks link or a speech bubble or free text, um, the annotations within the document are, are, I guess, one of the appealing features. People are used to marking up a document, annotating it. You can't draw on it. You can't underline things as such. But what you can do 
is left click and drag over the top of text uh, and then put a comment against it. And it will highlight the text and have your comment next to it. So you can get highlighting after a fashion. Once we switch Thank to you. the second um, kind of option within the marking, the, the summative feedback, as I said, you get up to a thousand words in there. There's some basic editing options, bold italics, underline or hyperlinks. It will also take tables, amazingly, boxes from Word or from Outlook, et cetera, that you can paste in here to help you organize that information. We'll get to that in a second as to why that's kind of useful or powerful. Above it, I would like to point out the voice comment, the voice feedback option. Up to three minutes, you can pause it as you go and it will just pick up on whatever uh, audio input you've got going on. Um, so you could, for example, start the marking process and do it sort of progressively as you're going in, saying, look, I'm really um, enjoying this part of what you've done here or whatever. This part needs work. Pause it, move on to another bit, add more feedback. For example, you don't have to do it all in one hit. I've had people sort of coming in and saying, um, oh, well, I'm going to get to the end of it. I'm just giving sort of general feedback rather than quite targeted. It can be targeted. You just got to pause it. So, you know, as, as you uh, using that tool, if it's rubbish and you don't like it, you can hit the delete button. It'll get rid of the comment. So the audio feedback is there for you to use. Um, Karen. Yeah. Um, does it? So if I'm doing that as summative feedback at the end and I'm, I'm pausing all the way through, does it scroll with me for the student to see? Ah, okay. No, they, so what happens <laughs> with the student view when they get their feedback is um, it's quite condensed. You get some, some basically some buttons or drop downs they need to click on to get the full text of the summative feedback to hit the play button for the audio. It's all kind of compressed essentially alongside their document and they have to click on things to reveal and listen to them. And whilst we can see, for example, if we look at a previous uh, submission, whether or not students have viewed their feedback, that's, that's it. We get no other analytics or learning information about uh, what they've done with it. How long did they listen to it for? Did they look at it for long? What sections of the text? We get none of that. We get to see that they've opened it. That's it. That's the, the confirmation that we get in terms of, of the feedback, which I guess is more than what we get from Blackboard uh, from the Grade Centre, but still it's not um, a milestone uh, maybe to, to squat about in that sense. All right, getting back to um, our marking as such. Uh, because our rubric tool, if I look at that first before I come back to using tables and things in here, because our rubric tool is a qualitative rubric, when we click on the box, we get this condensed uh, view with a scale that we can drag, etc. But really, most people want to be able to see what those criterion are, the text in detail. So you can hit those crosshairs and open them up. And we have a qualitative rubric, which allows us to left click and highlight different cells. And again, I'll say it again, visual indication only. It has no bearing on the score or the grade. Um, at this point, the academic has all of the discretion in the world to turn around and say, even though this thing's worth 35 marks, I've somehow made a connection between you getting a distinction and for this and some mark out of five in my head that you will now get. It's not particularly transparent as such. You've probably got your own marking processes, et cetera, that are quite detailed, but student sees none of that with a qualitative rubric. They see that what they've done is, is as fallen into these categories and it all really comes down to how detailed or not detailed your description is, your descriptor in each of the scales. So I'm not kind of, kind of gonna delve into that too far. All I'm saying is that there is a visual indication of how they've gone and ultimately they get a score uh, and they make that connection. That is a qualitative rubric in a nutshell. What you can do at that point, if you wanted to then have um, a better breakdown of how um, their score in the rubric uh, equates to marks, is it's very common practice for people to use a tally table. Um, I can give you a look at what that looks like. Uh, is this one of those? Yes, it is. All right, if we have a look, this is a nursing subject, for example, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students. They like to use a qualitative rubric, but they also want to be able to provide students with the detail of 
how they got their individual uh, grade calculated. They also mark out of 100 and that'll then get converted manually back to the actual waiting for the task. So they have pasted a box, a tally table in here, which they have then, the marker has then populated progressively. Right, so you get the qualitative rubric, but then they are actually putting in those individual scores, writing the total, then adding in their additional comments, remember up to a thousand words. And this has become, I would say at this point in time, the most common way to approach using qualitative rubrics here is using a table which shows what the actual score is against each criterion and then the comments. It's become pretty common practice. The way we get to uh, putting a tally table in, as I mentioned before, uh, it will take, uh, let me get back to the one that we were actually marking in, that one. So we have our empty summative text feedback box here. All I've done in Outlook, you can use Word just as easily, is I've created a two column table with as many rows as you need for criterion, as well as a heading and a total. And I can then, as well as an additional comments subheading, copy that, paste it straight into your summative feedback section. And at that point, your markers are ready to go with putting in the scores for each bit and then the total and then the comments. And they can just po populate that. Because uh, the integration means anyone who has full staff or instructor access to the subject site can mark in here. It means that you could put in this, then another person, another instructor could come in afterwards and populate other bits. Um, there is shared marking going on, et cetera, at different times sometimes with people doing different parts. Up until the, the, the actual feedback re release date for the students, you can keep coming back in here and making adjustments. So it can be done progressively and by different people. Um, it's going to auto save the feedback. So the next time the next person comes in, this will be there waiting for them as well. So that's the tally table in a nutshell. But ultimately, if you've determined that the final score for this person happens to be, I don't know, 25 out of 35 or whatever the case may be, you still then have to type in the, the grade up the top. And then that will flow through this grade through to the grade center automatically. That is how the, the integration works, goes through pretty much close to instantly, um, unless Blackboard's having a bit of a meltdown and then sometimes it can take an hour or two, but most of the time it's pretty much instantaneous. All right, I'm gonna stop there for a second. We've been talking about qualitative feedbacks using the rubric tool as a visual indication, using a tally table as well as uh, the other tools in the set. I'll stop there and take comments, questions from the floor before we start looking at quantitative. What do people think? It looks good to me, the, the, especially the examples you gave. The, um, uh, you know, the off on off column in on off setting in grade center. Yep. Is that the same as making it visible, not visible in that web link? 100%. Okay. Yep. That's a great question. So. Uh, within the actual object settings in I2, when we created the portal, if you edit that setting visible to students, this is talking about the grade center column. It is acts absolutely the same as going into the grade center itself. Finding the object, remembering that when you add things in, um, make sure you can find the object that usually adds it as the last column in the grade center, the most recent one. There it is. It's hidden. If I turn around and make that uh, visible, hide column on and off, let's make it visible again. If I go back into that folder again now and have a look at those settings, you'll see that it's now on yes. It's exactly the same thing, the same setting. Yeah. Not to be confused with making the object available and unavailable, which is that first option there. When you do that, that stops the student seeing the link at all for this object, right? So there's a, there's a difference between the two. Any other questions or comments before we start looking at quantitative rubrics? Uh, Lachlan. Go ahead. 
Yes, I missed a bit. So is the qualitative marking per default? Or did I have to tick the box somewhere? No, it is default. Yeah, oh. it comes down. Um, we have three different types of rubrics to choose from when you import to the rubric manager and default is qualitative marked with a zero, I guess, to show that it's giving zero marks for the rubric. Maybe. I don't know. It's a zero. It's qualitative. Okay. That's the default setting. Okay. All right. Are we good to get into qual uh, quantitative now? Okay. Now, what I'm proposing for the purpose of uh, this morning is... I would like to experiment with the idea that this task, we're going to mark it as a quantitative rubric instead of a qualitative rubric so that the marker then has the grade automatically determined by clicking on the different rubric cells. So the process is the same. I'm going to close this student submission. I will clear it so that poor Dominic is not uh, affected by me meddling around today. But what I'm going to do by going into our portal, into our settings. We might clear his submission attempt at this point. Back into the assignment settings. You can certainly chop and change these around if you need to, but this was our qualitative rubric that I used before. What I'm going to do now is import the same rubric in. I'm going to need to give it a different uh, title. So let's do that. If I just save this as file, save as, we'll call this quant. We'll just stick the word quant on the end. I'm going to go import again, find the file. Okay, it doesn't mind that one. Go back in. I'm going to load it from the list, law 309. Quant, 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 quant. Why can't I see it? I'm going insane. 309 quant. There it is. Thank you. All right. So down the bottom here, we've got our different rubric types. This time around, I'm going to shift this to a custom rubric. There are two types of quantitative rubrics that Turnitin offers. The first one is called a quantitative rubric. It's the percentages. And what it allows you to do is to determine one value for the entire column for high distinctions, one value only. So for example, 184, whatever, whatever that number is, one value only that will apply to each, but you then have the ability to determine the weighting for each criterion. So if you're saying that the first criterion is worth 40% of the task and the second one is worth 20 or whatever, you can do that within um, the qualitative, the percentage marks, sorry, quantitative percentage marks rubric, the first option. This is not very popular because we don't usually put our rubrics together in this way. We usually have particular marks, et cetera, in mind. So when most of the staff that have been using quantitative rubrics this session have been opting for this second option, which is a custom rubric, it's still quantitative, but it allows for you to determine the value for each cell against each criterion. Now, the limitation at this point, when you start putting these in, I'll get into the detail of that in a second. The main limitation is you've got one value only. So when your markers start going through here, a high distinction will always have to be full marks for that particular criterion. So this one, for example, is worth five marks. High distinction is always going to have to be worth the maximum amount. If you don't put in the maximum amount for those criteria, it won't calculate the score properly. It won't allow the student to get a mark out of 35, for example. It'll reduce it. So we have to actually put that in. 10. The next one was 10 as well. And the last one is 10. And then we need values to go alongside each of these. Now, what I'd like to point out is that when we use these rubrics, the, 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 the quantitative rubrics, it will convert whatever mark goes into the rubric into the weighting for the task that you set when you created it. So we said this task was worth 35. So I don't actually have to make the rubric equal 35. It'll convert it. So if you want to mark out of 100 in here, you can do that. It'll still convert it to a mark out of um, uh, 35 or whatever your task weighting is. It'll do the conversion for you. 
So with that um, kind of in mind, what I'm going to propose here is that we actually create each of these with, with these kind of broad high distinction, distinction, credit pass, et cetera, values in mind. So a mark out of 100 for each of the cells. We'll come back to whether or not that works against each of these marks. But with that main limitation in mind that it will only let me put in one value, most markers want at least the ability to determine a high value and a low value for each criterion. So a high credit versus a low credit rather than just agreeing on the one, the one score. So if I want to do this in this tool, the Excel rubric that I've been using needs more columns. You need it prepared in advance with more columns for me to use. So let's say a high and a low value for each ready to import. This is really easy to do in Excel. We can literally turn around, click on the label header. So the column header and insert, it'll give me a blank row. And then at that point, I can turn around and copy a whole column across and do that five times. It doesn't have to be arduous. You're using the same descriptors. The only difference really for us in this case is one of these is going to be high and you can call it high. Turn it into a bit fiddly. It doesn't like too many characters. So I'm going to call this HD high and the next one HD. You guessed it, low. And I'm going to do that five times. I know this is fascinating to watch. Makes for good radio. Hi, and we'll just use our short Sorry. letters. Go Look, ahead. Would it be easier to say HD 100%, HD 85%? You can do that, and we're going to have to specify that in a second. You can change the labeling however you want. Yeah. Okay. If they're having those percentages in there is misleading, for example, um, you can absolutely change those. Some people um, definitely do change that. What I've actually done is I've created a template to go in the same folder for quantitative rubrics that has these columns pre-made, high, low, high, low, high, low, and then you can just populate those. And it doesn't need more fine-grained qual descriptors for those other levels? I don't personally think so. I think the descriptors, okay. if they're good enough for your subject outline, mm. then they're good mm. enough for this. Okay. I, don't, I don't think you need to make that distinction. Uh, for lack of a better term, distinction between the two. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the main point is that uh, you're specifying that the student submission is sat high in that range rather than low in the range, et cetera. Make sense? And we'll see how that pans out in, in terms of determining the grade. I'm almost there. I'm Taking that whole column across. Lachlan, this might be a really silly question, but since you can actually put a table into the, the feedback column um, in the qualitative assessment, yeah. why would you go to this effort to do this? Uh, and I'm I'll missing show you. something. Yeah, I will show you. It's not, it's not a bad question at all. The reason that we do this is because instead of you having to manually calculate the grade, once we do this, this will actually calculate it for us ah, and put okay. it straight into the results. If you've got 20 students, maybe that's not a big deal. If you've got 600, like some of those nursing subjects do, maybe that calculation and conversion process represents a significant amount of time. Yeah. No worries. Um, thank you. Yeah. No, not a, no, it's not a bad question at all. I think Can I ask only... another? Sorry. Please, go ahead. I was going to ask another silly question. Um the fail columns always bugged me because it's 50% of the marks. Yeah. Is there any reason that I couldn't have like a, a fail, fail, a fail, and a kind of fail? Absolutely. You could have as many columns as you <laughs> like with any difference between them. And like, you're a uh, like a 25%, like a 10%, a 25%, and a 40% kind of level. Absolutely. You can do that. Because that bugs me that I'm never able to get that through QA. I'm just going to give this a slightly different um, uh, name because I've already got a file in here called quant. So I've just added the letter X to it. Okay. Sorry for that incredibly boring stuff. 
we're now going to add, add in that quantitative rubric. Import. It's got that slightly adjusted name. Still got a tick. Good. Got to find it in the list. Quant X. That's the one. Do I really want to switch this rubric? This is because I started make, doing some marking beforehand and I made adjustments. Yes, I do. Okay. I got four columns. Uh, sorry, I've got four criterion. I've got all these columns. It's still selected qualitative by default. I'm going to switch it across to custom. Now I've got to put in my values. Now what I've done um, beforehand, and this kind of ties into the comment you were making a second ago, is that I've established what I want each of those to be so that there is a bit of a spread between them. Keeping in mind, um, you can have as many columns as you like, use the values that you like. If you need to, if you want to have five columns between each of these, uh, you can, but for, for this, I'm just going high and low. So I've got those values there. I can just put those in. And at this point we can go, right. So this is worth a hundred. Next one we said was going to be worth 87. And, and it will we always can... pick up from the top, won't it? It'll uh, pick up the top of the range. The first one has to be the top of the range. Mm -hmm. All of these are, are, are determined by what value you put into the columns. Yep. Okay. All right. So um, that's, we end up putting all those scores in. And then what we actually then get uh, this thing to do by clicking on those values is that it will calculate our final score for us. Now, I've actually got a subject where I've done this in advance. I'm not going to make you sit through me putting in all these values. But once you add the quantitative rubric in, it will then give us that final calculated grade for us. The question is, can I remember what the subject code is? I feel like I did it yesterday. Let's go with, hang on, I'm going to find it before I make a huge mistake. It was... Vet science, let's go with VSC. Two eighty three. Two two six. I'm glad I checked, otherwise, this could have been really painful. All right, so we've got one in here already. They had a task that we added a quantitative rubric to yesterday. Not quite sure what's going on there. Is that the task? Maybe. It is not the task. Where's the portal? Where's the portal? It's not it. going slightly insane. All right. I don't want to waste your time with that. Um, I will try and find it in the background so I can demonstrate the marking process to you. But um, I'll take some questions and comments at this point while I'm chasing this stuff down. What do people think about this process so far? Has anyone used a quantitative rubric to date? I haven't used this one, but I've used one in marking exams through the exams system in Blackboard. Right. And I, and I find it really useful. It's really fast. Um, and it, at the end of the day, the, the, the minute differences between the marks are, once, once it ends up that the whole thing's out of 30% or something anyway, it, it's of limited concern like it doesn't actually change people's marks all that much so <clears throat> so I find it really useful comes out in the wash it comes out in the wash and it's really fast and um, it saves my brain because doing the maths and the the 16 spreadsheets of conversion from this to that to something or other else is where mistakes happen yeah so I, I actually prefer it to um and that's what I was really hoping to get out of today. 
<laughs> was that we could do the same thing. I think the two columns is a bit odd. <clears throat> um, and probably I'll have to do that because of the way the subject outline is written at the moment. It would have to be done that way. But mm -hmm. I think looking in the future at changing it from a percentage to an actual mark per our criteria might just clear that up and make it a bit easier because if there's a low and a high it would seem to me you probably do as Chris said need to adjust the rubric um but that's an argument well no it's a discussion it's a robust discussion it is I'll a need discussion. to have with my teaching team <laughs> absolutely <laughs> all right so um in the interim thank you Karen for that as well and it's also given me time to uh, pretend like I had something arranged to demonstrate here so I have a faux submission in a subject with a quantitative rubric ready to roll. If I click on the rubric tool here, we get a mark. It's a science subject. They mark out of 100, the final grades out of 20. If I open up the custom rubric area here, we get our columns. They have a high and a low value against each. They've got their waiting for the task. They've already figured out what each is worth, but this is going to end up calculating because the academic had actually figured out all these values in advance themselves to put into the custom rubric. So let's say that this student has then got a HD for that, distinction for that, distinction for that, credit for that, a low credit for that. We work our way through. There are all of our marks. Down the bottom left-hand corner, we can see a progressive tally, 77.1, a word on decimal places at that point, Inside the actual marking of the rubric, it'll take up to two decimal points against each of these criterion that you can see. When it calculates the final score and does the conversion, it will round every time. The final grade in turn it in won't take part marks. So it will round out that score. So you can certainly use them in here, but the final grade will be rounded. We get a total out of 77 here. We can hit apply to grade. Wait for this to go gray. It's been done. Close that. And you'll see that it has done the conversion up the top to the mark for the weighting of the task. And that has then flowed automatically through to the grade center. So job done at that point. So it is, I guess it depends on the scale. This isn't to say that the type of feedback that you provide in the summative comment area or your quick marks or anything else lose any of their efficacy as such it's simply that the calculation of the grade can be done instantly automatically etc if you want that to be more finessed and you don't like just having a high and a low yeah you can add as many columns per criterion scale as you like but i feel like you're starting to lose some of the um time saving stuff that we've been talking about at that point and it is only about time planning, isn't it? There's no qualitative benefit at all in doing this unless there's new descriptors written. 100%. 100%. Okay. You can't argue against that. Basically, the descriptors okay. are the same. This is simply about um, scale, I guess, at that point as well. But um, I feel like the qualitative aspect can also be addressed in other areas within the feedback, such as either through the use of, of the audio feedback, the summative comments, etc. And I've yet to really be wowed by any criterion description that I've seen in a subject outline. I wait to be proven wrong, but by and large, I think by the time people are putting those into the subject outline, if we're being frank, hopefully it's at least adequate. Detailed, not so much. Um, but then again, you may have some great ones and I, I welcome seeing those. And that's where I would argue that having an actual mark makes more sense anyway than the percentage that's a good point all right i'm uh, before i forget i am going to start clearing away some of the mess that i've made here against each of these um things so look i'm going to stop there we're almost at time as well um what do people think about the two have i swayed anybody are you now going to get off the fence and say i absolutely want to use quant i really am going to stick to using qualitative I'm not sure. I want to talk to you more about it. What do people think? I mean, I could easily just make up six tables and paste the right one in, couldn't I? And focus on the comments. You could certainly do that. There's no sort of um, compulsion to use one or the other. Mm. Um, it really is about the, the perceived benefit. I, I like both. 
I do. Yeah. But I, I also like seeing um, an integrated system that passes information from one to the other very quickly and, and sort of seamlessly. I, I'm, I like that as well. Kim Bailey, we've been playing around with your subject site in the background here. How do you feel about all this? Yeah, I think I probably should have a go at the um, quantitative rubrics. Um, it, it, it's it's something I've sort of been tossing around, but law students love to argue, and so they always argue about their marks and having a bit more granular detail in marks could be good. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll have a go. Anyone else care to weigh in? I've just got a couple of things to tidy up after this piece. No worries. I'm I'm just clearing up my mess, by the way, getting rid of the um, the grade that it flowed through to the grade centre automatically, et cetera, for that poor student. Um, okay, so we've gone through that process. Ruth, I see you nodding a lot there in the background. How do you feel about all this? Oh, I love things that are automated and I've used the rubrics in grade centre and they, I hate setting them up. They're such a pain to set up. Um, but I guess given that I used them, I it was making sense how to use these ones and where it was different. And I I probably like the quantitative, quantitative ones, like with the numbers and then it automatically tallying and going through. I I really like that. And I, I use Norfolk a lot with the automatic comments, like I've saved lots of comments. So the fact that you can have those comments in turn it like doing it all in one space, I think sounds good too. Absolutely. And that's an excellent point because if you're using um, quick marks inside Turnitin, they are attached to your profile. What that means is the next time you mark another assignment in, in the same subject or a different subject, et cetera, they're going to be available to you. So this isn't about having to recreate things. It's about the value add time and time and time again. Um, so that will travel with you. Your rubrics that you create are attached to your profile. So if you have a quantitative rubric that you use in this subject for assessment two, the next time that you teach in another subject, if it's similar enough and you would rather just bring it in and, and edit that rubric, you can do that in Turnitin. It follows your profile, not the subject, not Turnitin. It's, it's, it follows you. So there's affordances there. Um, I do have a couple of comments that I've written underneath for us to just keep in mind. Okay, we've talked about Turnitin will always round the final mark out, but two decimal points. Okay, otherwise um, the final grade will flow through immediately or close enough. Student visibility is controlled by the feedback release date uh, for the Turnitin assignment, but the task visibility is controlled by that visibility to students option. We looked at those things. What else have we got? The final text area up to a thousand words, individual um, uh, quick marks comments. The descriptors will take up to a hundred words. So that's the difference between the two. Students don't get an email notification when they submit to the integration in Turnitin. When they submit, they get a visual confirmation on the screen, a green message that is a digital receipt and they can choose to download that if they want to get their receipt. It is a timestamp only. It says your document's been received. This is the time, the place, the portal. And usually the types of issues that we have with students is, is them saying, I did submit it. Uh, I got the receipt, here you go. And what we can actually see from the receipt is they've submitted it to the wrong place because the receipt will show you the title of the assignment that they have submitted to. It's usually to do with students submitting into the Check My Assignment generic portals. If you're familiar with them, they're the ones that the students can um, access through the student portal. So at least if you get the receipt, we can point out straight away, you've submitted it to the wrong place. It's so, why we try and create these into those folders, those clearly labeled folders, assessment two, turn it in submission portal. Please don't get lost between here and here. Um, but it'll still happen. You're going to get comments at some point from a student saying, I've, I've submitted it. As soon as we see that receipt, we know exactly where it's gone. So, but they can resubmit multiple times here. Up like until even, the due date. Yeah, which they couldn't do with the other one because they Correct. would have to wait 24 hours before they could resubmit it or something like that. So the I way that, that 
Yeah, that's a really good point, Karen. So the way that Turnitin works, unfortunately, this isn't something we have any wiggle room on at all, is every individual Turnitin portal set up has a limit of three submissions up to the set date for the task. And then you have to wait 24 hours before you can try and submit again. Mm -hmm. So when those old school facing portals were created, that's one portal for every assignment the student's going to submit for the year not even for the one task, for every assignment. So after they've done it three times, whether it's for the same task or multiple tasks, they got to wait a whole day before they can use it again, mm -hmm. which kind of sucks, at mm -hmm. least when it is at the individual assignment level. Uh, if I had every student trying to submit three times to adjust their work, et cetera, I'd be stoked. So I think three is a, a far better improvement per task than um, three for every assignment you're going to do over the course of the year. Yeah, it's a yep. really good point. Awesome. All right. We're one minute two and we've flown through there. I'm happy to stick around for a minute if people have got other questions, et cetera. But otherwise, thank you for bearing with me through this um, run through of Paul versus quant rubrics, marking and turn it in and messing with Kim Bailey subject sites. Uh, I'll see you all at the next one. Have a good week. Thanks, Lachlan. See you, folks.